Um, I think we, our recommendation of the, the, you have to use the magic word, which is no gracias, no thank you, okay? There might be people trying to sell you cigars, and generally the cigars are uh, fake. I mean, they're not fake, but they, the brand is fake. They take a, a very expensive uh, brand uh, label and they put it in very cheap cigars and they sell it to you. Um, they try to sell, it, um, or they try to buy you to uh, the house to have coffee. Um, to me, it's a hustler is not seen and it's not bad. And actually, I, I, I would say you should talk to hustler, but don't talk to a hustler for more than five minutes unless you have a lot of money or you want to waste your time here in Cuba. And generally in Cuba, Cubans are very friendly and it's very easy to meet people here and you talk to them. And, but if you're walking in a tourist area and somebody say, hey friend, where are you from? In a beautiful English, probably, probably you're gonna be hassled eventually, okay? <laughs> and um, if it's okay to approach Cubans here in the street. Um, go to various neighborhoods, go to walk, uh, walk around, talk to people and approach people and you'll notice that most Cubans are no hustlers. But when people go to uh, uh, nearby hotels or near to, uh, in the tourist areas, you will find people who are very good and very smart hustlers. Um, one more thing. In terms of uh, some uh, cultural aspect, we're gonna, since we're going to be meeting a lot of Cubans, um, it's uh, common among Cubans to kiss each other. And here, we kiss in the mouth. I hope everybody's okay with that. <laughs> no, we kiss in the mouth when we have a romantic relationship. <laughs> But when we greet, we kiss on the cheek, okay? We kiss on the cheek, and that's common, okay? If you don't feel that like you want to be kissed, it's okay. You tell them, look, at my country, we don't kiss when we meet for the first time. And you shake your hand, okay? But especially among young people. Young people, it's very common just to give you a kiss, and it's okay to, between women and women, men and men, and women and men. It's more common between uh, women and women, and women and men. But among men, it's now becoming very cool, especially among young people. It's cool to kiss another man. Um, also, those of you who like, who are planning to go dancing, uh, dancing, uh, uh, there's some dancing that can be a little sensual for some of you, and um, just be prepared. Um, and um, if you don't feel comfortable by dancing too close or to move your hips too much, um, you just tell them, look, I mean, in my country, in my culture, you know, we don't, you know, dance that close. Okay? Um, we have plenty of opportunity to go dancing. Forget the rest of you, that's the only important part. Uh, All right, California! Oh, California! Oh, All right, some of you know... Washington State! Washington State! Somewhere in the South! <laughs> they, you hear, they don't make a lot of noise about it, right? <laughs> so we have another birthday today, and it's Mona's birthday! Song. Take it away, Medea. Okay. Happy birthday, happy, happy birthday. We're in love with you, with you. The happiness be near, the out the coming year, and all the best to you. May your troubles fade away, and may you smile every day, and may you never, ever, ever be blue. Happy birthday to you! Now we expect all of you to give her a happy birthday hug. Uh, environmentalists! Yay. Anyone involved in the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah. Alright, any writers here? Woo. What else do you do? Immigration! Immigration! Rock on! Gender equality! Woo. Progressive politics. Progressive politics. I like it. It's all encompassing. Rock and roll. I hear rock and roll. Alright. Yeah, that's what I like. I want to introduce uh, Leima Martinez, who is the representative of ECAP here. Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to the name venue of the Cuban Institute of Friendship uh, with the people. Uh, this morning we are expecting the visit of uh, you know, two very important people. One is Ricardo Alacón, 
former president of the National Assembly in Cuba, and the other person is the president of ICAP, Kenya Serrano. But uh, I don't know if you know that in the last Code Pink group, we agreed that it was kind of a, an American tsunami to Cuba, so that is happening. So a lot of people are coming, not only Americans, but other nationalities that are participating in the celebration of May 1st. So they are welcoming other groups, so they will come very, very soon to share with you some time. Where huh? from the world are people coming? <coughs> In this? Who are they? What parts of the world are they? Well, people from Latin America, from, there is a specific brigade from Canada, the Che Guevara Brigade. There are people from Europe, there are people from Asia. So everybody is trying to come to Cuba to celebrate May 1st because in this uh, specific year we have the happiness of having the Cuban Five with us. So everybody. Wow. Thank you very much, Leima. And Leima is going to be with us in an outer. She's very busy, but uh, she's one of the one, one of the person who help uh, to arrange all these uh, meetings and especially all these important yeah, meetings. Exactly. Um, also, I want to um, uh, introduce. When George Bush put out that color-coded stupid alert system, oh, remember? Yeah. Yeah. It was the yellow, don't be too scared, the orange, get more scared, the red, get really scared. But nobody knew what they were supposed to do when they got scared except for to say, go invade Iraq, rah, rah, rah. And um, so the, we were a group of women at an environmental retreat that was talking about how scary it was that here we were about to invade Afghanistan and maybe even Iraq and um, that we needed a different color-coded alert system. So one of the women said, I know, let's do hot pink. And we said, that sounds great, except when we looked it up, it was a porn site. So we, <laughs> so we ended up with just plain old pink. But pink wasn't part of the color-coded bush alert system. So it was to say, there are other ways to deal with this and not going invading other countries that had nothing to do with 9-11. So that's where the pink came from. We do feel sometimes a little cultish. Uh, it's not true. <laughs> and we don't make, we have really, really great people at Code Pink that hate pink and never wear pink. So it's not obligatory. It's also, as you know, it's women led, but there are lots of lovely, wonderful men that are part of Code Pink. So we want you to all feel comfortable about being part of this without feeling that you have to be cult-like with the pink. Um, but uh, let's see, while we're waiting, um, I thought it was amazing how many people here are doing work around Palestine. Let's see another show of hands for that. Wow, that's quite amazing. Yeah. And also, um, people have already, are, are there maybe some stories people want to give from their interactions with Cubans already last night? Yeah, you want to come up and, and say? Anybody with the prosecutor? Why don't you come up and use the mic? Because, yeah, you were telling me. I wanted, I wanted to ask if anybody knows about the involvement of NGOs in Cuba and if uh, they are allowed to work in Cuba. <laughs> NGOs in Cuba and if they are allowed to come here and work with Cuba and how many of them are present in Cuba? So a very good question. I will answer as far as I know. There are many NGOs like Code Pink is an NGO. Uh, NGO just means our uh, tax status in the U.S. is one of a tax exempt. There are plenty of people that would like to take away our tax exempt status, but um, there are many NGOs around the world that work in Cuba. Many European NGOs are working here, U.S. NGOs. Uh, a more interesting question, I would think, is about NGOs in Cuba, mm -hmm. um, Cuban NGOs. So that's a big controversy. There are Cuban mass organizations that would be the equivalent of NGOs, civil society groups. 
like the uh, Small Farmers Association, like the Women's Association, like the Youth Federation, uh, the Writers' Union. Um, there are many organizations like that. Separately, there are groups of dissidents that have formed their own organizations, and many of them are getting financial support from the US or from Europe. So um, it is uh, an issue about how legitimate groups are depending on who is financing them, and we can talk more about that later, but we are very honored to have our guest speaker here. So um, sorry, we'll do more of this uh, discussions throughout the whole week. And um, I do want to just say also that at this time when there are people from all over the world, this is a really special time to, to be in Cuba, we are very, very lucky to be here at ECAP, and we are very, very honored to be with the president of ECAP and with Ricardo. She's running around everywhere. So really, give her a big, 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 big. And we also have somebody who I consider like the leading intellectual um, in Cuba and political voice. Uh, he was the president of the National Assembly. Um, he is uh, one of the most brilliant people that I have met, and we are so honored to have a chance to talk to him, um, uh, Ricardo Alarcón. And this is a very, very, very busy time for both of them. So we know that we pulled a lot of strings to get here and to have you speak to us, so we thank you so much for that. Thank you. Sally will help me out. About your reality, your social struggles, we are in solidarity with you. We are in solidarity with many movements in the United States that are really looking for more justice, for more equality, for more inclusivity in the, in, in, in the United States. And of course, it is an inspiration for us. In Cuba, we are with many visitors these days. We are receiving activists from more than 40 countries for the May Day, just ICAP. When we are with the trade union movement, you will see people coming from about 80 countries of the world for the May Day Parade. It is going to be huge, it is going to be amazing, because it is the first time in 16 years that we have the Cuban Five with us. Solidarity, but also of the people of Cuba in the world, in the United States. Many of you, I know that you were active in that uh, campaign, including uh, Code Pink. Additionally, of course, we will have the uh, uh, unique opportunity to hear our comrade Alarcón, but of course, I don't want to miss this opportunity to uh, tell you that the priority today in our international solidarity movement it is to defeat the U.S. blockade against us. Yes, to, to defeat the, the U.S. blockade. And it means to uh, allow the Cuban people to develop by ourselves without this hostility, without this policy that creates a lack of material resources to the Cuban people and also has prevented us to do more solidarity. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, why do you want the blockade to be lifted? I will answer you immediately, because we need to do more solidarity with the peoples of the world. Not only because of the damages and the impact that the blockade has in our everyday lives. No, we need to end the blockade because it is illegal, because the blockade has an extraterritorial uh, expression in other countries of the world against the Cuban cooperation with the South and also because we are a people that by law, the national uh, constitution of Cuba establishes that it is a principle for the Cuban revolution. It is a principle of our foreign policy. To be internationalist, to be in solidarity with other peoples of the world, 
to share what we have, not to give what is uh, spared by, by, by us. So welcome to Cuba. We are with you and we hope to have good questions and we will try to answer all those uh, questions that you may have. But of course, we are here for the respectful relation between Cuba and the US. And in this new moment, when we are rejoining our relations, let us take advantage for building peace between Cuba and the US. Let us take advantage for uh, demanding again the Guantanamo territory, the illegally occupied territory. <laughs> We need that territory for being part of the Cuban nation, of the Cuba, Cuban island, and I know that Kofi has a very interesting proposal, what to do with that territory institution. But first, we have to guarantee that the current administration uh, decides what should be decided since the very beginning of his administration, and it is to close the prison there and to return the Guantanamo territory. I shall cry the words. <laughs> this will make a speech. Just a clarification. Merea Mere is a, a good friend, and sometimes she is inclined to exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> I would be very, very happy for 50% of the energy for myself that she makes more very generous. And that's it. If you, if you have questions, I will try to cooperate with uh, Kenya to, to answer them. Thank you. So why don't we start with some questions that people can say while we're writing some other ones. Do you want to answer? Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to ask a, a bit of an uh, open question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> give you an opportunity yeah. to give us your view yeah. in a way. So the, the question is, is, is the glass half full or half empty with the relationship with the United States? And the important part is, is the glass being emptied or being filled? So it's a question about is the glass half empty or full with respect to the opening with the United States and which direction is that glass going in? In my personal, thanks for this question. In my personal view, we put a rhythm in the, the way we want things to happen. It means that Cuba knows what to want to, to achieve from this process. Can you understand my English? Yes. 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 Oh, so it means that of course. Be open. Be open. Yes, 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 yes. We are open. We are uh, educated to be open-minded. <laughs> so I believe that there are many obstacles. Uh, for instance, the blockade. You know that for the rejoining of the Cuba-US diplomatic relations, there is not a bank where our consulate in Washington can uh, have our bank accounts and so on. There is Guantanamo. There are many other uh, topics on the table, but I believe that the first thing is happening is that there is the political willingness to go forward. And that political willingness has been established by our two presidents. It means that on December the 17th, it was the announcements made by two presidents, equal presidents. No one very powerful and the other, the, the other president a weak president. No, no, no. In our understanding, the very important thing to observe in this scenario is that we are talking in condition of equals. And in my view, talking about the, the, the glasses, is, it, I think it is more full than empty because it is the result of our resistance. It is the result of not doing any concession. It is the result that the US government recognized that the policy of Cuba was wrong and is a total failure. So it is, for us, it is more full than empty, in my view, in my view. But here, this kind of expertise. Okay, so we have a good one for Alarcon here. 
We have a very good question for Ricardo Alarcón here, which is, what are the important lessons from what happened to socialism in the USSR after perestroika? The important lessons. Well, that's a very good question. But uh, probably will take uh, a lot of time to answer it. And more than one voice to answer it. I don't think that anybody is in a position to. Um, there could be many, many explanations, but I will just, just uh, remember that uh, half a century ago, in 1964, 1965, Ernesto Guevara, Che, anticipated what happened. Um, a lot has been uh, said about Che, his uh, Bolivian uh, uh, fighting, his death, and, and so on. But he was also a very clever, very intelligent uh, theoretician. He was a very young man, but in the, in the mid 60s, when nobody on earth believe that uh, the so-called real socialist world was going to disappear, he said that, that the way it was uh, conceived, the way it was uh, uh, promoted or developed would lead to uh, the restoration of capitalism in that country. In those days, everybody was taking Back by, by, by such a, a, a theory, but he was right. There is an American intellectual also who said more or less the same, uh, Charles Wright Mills, when he wrote a very important book on Cuba in 1960, 61. In that book, and in other books who wrote around the, the early 60s, he developed the theory of convergence. In his view, the way the Soviet movement was being developed, notwithstanding the, the, the political uh, confrontation, the propaganda, and all that, was similar to the way Capitalism was being developed in the West, particularly in the West, and that someday both will be uh, together in the same path. That means, perhaps the most important lesson is that uh, it is necessary to reflect, to study, to look by yourself, to try to not to follow dogmas, not to follow um, established concept, established concepts, but to think of your own mind, and uh, maybe the next time we will not be surprised by history, as uh, the majority was surprised in this case, regarding the question us, but at the least these two individuals were not. They wrote about that, they anticipated that, and they were proven right. The, it has to do with the motivation, the, 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 the instrument that you use to mobilize uh, people, and uh, perhaps the most fundamental one, just to give one answer to a very complex question, is that socialism is not, could not be conceived just as a material process, just the development of the economic forces and uh, bringing that uh, equality and so forth. It's above all a moral thing. And we need to change the mentality, the way people relate to each other, 
this idea of human solidarity of the uh, spiritual spiritual values and so on what Chen put in this word the so-called moral incentive which is very very difficult according to him that would lead to the creation of a new man of course also a new woman uh, and uh, that's a very short phrase new man or try to achieve that. It's a real challenge, historical challenge, something that no, nobody has so far uh, achieved. And uh, from a longer perspective, nobody should have been surprised of what happened in the Soviet Union. Nobody should have been surprised, but everybody was surprised because nobody was really looking in depth at, the, at how that society was developing at the soul. Sorry for the complete answer. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, questions about Miami Cubans or Cuban Americans who are against the opening. Uh, one is, how strong do you think their voice will be in the United States and how might this affect the dialogue? Uh, what will happen to the land and other property that was owned by uh, Cuban Americans uh, that want it back or want compensation? And how can we persuade Cubans in the U.S. to support lifting of the embargo uh, since they have such a negative view of what life in Cuba is today. Well, uh, well I think that, that uh, the, 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 the role of the Cuban Americans on, on this issue has been and still is a little bit one of the most important uh, elements of the manipulation of the um, people's mind by those who impose this policy. Everybody has read something about the powerful Cuban American National Foundation, for example. Very important. Cuban millionaires who were there paying politicians and promoting but who created that? Who had the idea of fabricating that instrument to advance the, the, the US policy to, towards Cuba? It was not a Cuban invention. It was a, an American invention. Was at the beginning of uh, President Reagan uh, um, tenure in the White House, there was a, a document that is not secret, that was published at that time, where a number of recommendations were made for the president. And one was the need to create a Cuban-American organization that would uh, lobby in Washington to advance the U.S. goals, the U.S. policy, the one that uh, President Reagan was going to, to instrument. I remember, when I was in New York, I remember when everybody talked about the China lobby. It was impossible to defeat the China lobby. The U.S. was embarked, embarked upon a stupid policy that nobody was following in the world of non-recognizing the People's Republic of China. The French recognized that decades uh, before the British, practically everybody. And we had every year the same debate on the recognition of the People's Republic of China at the U.N. And always, when you spoke with some American friends, no, it's very difficult, you know, the, this very 
powerful China lobby. Could anybody tell me where is that China lobby now? <laughs> what is? What happened with them? They simply disappear or for what reviews and their importance as time uh, pass by. But in the Cuban American case, it's even more clear. For example, you maybe here there are some Cubans living in this state. I think so. But the majority are American Americans, not Cuban Americans. Well, for years, the U.S. had established the travel ban, who continues to be enforced by the way. It's not just the economic embargo, it is also the prohibition for Americans to travel to Cuba, except if they are Cuban Americans. They're the only ones for years they have, there has been an exception to that prohibition. That's why we have uh, several flights every day from Miami. Miami is the town on earth from where more flights go to Cuba, not just Havana, even other Cuban cities. Why? Because all flights are supposed to be exclusively or almost exclusive for Cuban Americans, the exceptions to the rule. That means that around the, what, more than 400,000, almost half a million have visited Cuba or are visiting Cuba every year. But if you go and see what is the position of the this, the so-called representative of the Cuban-American community, the important, the powerful, and that, they, only, they oppose completely traveling to Cuba. But they had to accept that exception for a very simple reason, that there was a pressure from the community, those Cubans who have a, an inalienable right to visit their families and to, 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 to have a normal contact with their country. For years, the U.S. at the various administrations had pretended to justify their policy on the views of the Cuban-American community, which is a very clear way to misguide and mislead the public opinion. First of all, because those so-called agencies of the Cuban-American community were an American invention precisely to advance the American goals. And time had changed. Now, a large number of those Cubans are in favor of normalization of relations, of the end of the embargo, and have demonstrated that they do not believe in a travel ban. And they force the administration to have an exception for them. The other, other part of the question was referring to the former properties. The, what? <laughs> There are properties and properties. There are people who have their house, or their little farm, their, uh, which is part of their tradition, their family properties and so on. I don't exclude that they could have that return if that is possible, because uh, you know how many things can happen in anywhere in half a century. But uh, the idea of restoring Latifundia property, those big landowners who were um, um, expropriated by the aggressor reform law, it's simply out of the, the question. It's simply impossible. Then this idea, this idea of turning Cuba back to the 50s or the 40s, 
no no more the mood to the I said that and I would also like to say this the economic warfare against Cuba also called the embargo or the blockade had existed and continued to exist for more than 50 years we never compromise we never even promise to restore capitalism in order to get those policies change. Now, that is the beginning of a fundamental change. And according to the President of the United States, President Obama, it is because that policy failed. It would be absolutely uh, nonsense, ridiculous, to imagine that Cuba, after having won that battle, because we won that battle, we compromise and give back what we refused to give back before. It's absolutely unthinkable, unthinkable. Which doesn't mean, of course, that um, individual Cubans living there, having their families here, that's another dimension. That's not the big issue that separated us from the beginning. Um, ah, the, 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 the Cubans, um, many Cubans have, uh, have been uh, decisive, many Cubans living there, to bring, in the process of bringing about those changes. Um, they really deserve our respect and our tribute. Some of them were killed. Some of them were bombed. Some of them were threatened. Years after years, for a long period, but they maintained what was originally a very minority position, but that now is clear, the view, the large majority of the Cuban American not to mention the American-American population. And uh, that is the segment of the, of the Cuban immigration will continue growing. It is true that there was a, a, a substantial number of Cubans who left after 59. But let's not forget that there was always a very important Cuban community living in the U.S. The only problem is that it was very much discriminated against by the anti-Cuba policy. The Cuban Adjustment Act is the best example. It's the only migratory piece of legislation that you have in your country that do not include benefits for those who have appeared on U.S. soil every other migratory uh, reform or, or migratory law is conceived to uh, resolve the migratory situation of immigrants. Fabulous explanation. Um, we have a lot of questions here around the economy. Uh, some of them deal with how much of the problems of the Cuban economy are from the government's own bureaucracy? How much is the embargo? Can you give examples of each? Uh, and uh, haven't other countries been able to fill in uh, because of the problems of the embargo? And then another question is about how are the problems in Venezuela, both the decrease in the price of oil as well as the political turmoil in Venezuela affecting the Cuban economy since Venezuela has been subsidizing Cuban oil. Thank, thanks for the questions. Uh, first of all, we said uh, back in 2011 why we needed to update our economic models and we recognized three main reasons. One, the world economic crisis. Second, the impact of the U.S. blockade, and third, our own mistakes and the, the, the things that we were doing that didn't have the results we expected. 
in our internal uh, developing in our economy. So the answer is yes. So we have problems because of the three reasons. Because we are a small one small country that is also impacted by the world crisis. Remember that because of the US policy on Cuba, we do not have, we are not members of the IMF. Thank you. <laughs> not members, but that's a very good uh, thing for us because we are a sovereign country. But on the other hand, I mentioned that just to remind you that we do not have access to credits and loans and many other things that help other countries with preconditions, of course, but some other countries, developing countries like Cuba, they are in a way benefited from the IMF and the Inter-American Bank and so on, those mechanisms that are very um, negative, or negative for, for our countries. On the other hand, yes, the US blockade is affecting Cuba a lot. We do not have access to the US market. We do not have access to the US technologies. We do not have access to any bank in the United States. Our products cannot be sold in the USA. And some other, uh, because the question is asking about uh, some other partners willing to have trade with Cuba and how does it uh, help us in a way. Yes, but if you are, for instance, a Canadian and you want to sell Cuban products, uh, uh, I mean your products in the US, make sure that it doesn't have more than 10% of a Cuban component. Let us talk about a candy. If a candy has more than 10% of the Cuban sugar, you cannot sell it in the United States. Oh. Yes, that's, that's like this. It is not an example that I'm in, inventing here. It is real. It is uh, stated by law. And uh, of course, the limitation that the blockade establishes in terms of people-to-people -people relations. Alarcon already talked about that, but it is a real impact. Because let us, let us think that we can solve the market, the trade relations, and some other things. But what about the direct cultural exchange, people-to-people -people exchange between the Cuban people and the people of the US? For instance, we have a lot of things to, to, to share with you about our biotech results. Remember that, yes, we are a poor country, a developing country. But since 1982, we started to develop our biotech industry. And we have very good results. And we are sure that there are a lot of people in the US that is needing our biotech products. So you are also limited, you are also affected by the application of the US policy on the Cuban people. Another part of the question is uh, how does it, ah, the examples of our own bureaucracy. Yes, we have many examples. And publicly, we have said and we have recognized. I mean, in Parliament, the Cuban government, and many other civil society institutions, that one thing is that we are, as normally, Cubans are creative. And in a way, the dogmatism with which we have developed our economy sometimes has constituted an, a limitation in our own development. For instance, now since uh, the, the beginning of the updating process, we opened new um, uh, ways to do uh, self-employment, nuevos oficios, new jobs for self-employment. Now we have almost half a million Cubans exercising this uh, kind of, of job, self-employment. It is a very good uh, example in my uh, understanding that it is not, there is not contradiction between accompanying the revolutionary process and at the same time having your own small business or having your own uh, enterprise or whatever because in Cuba, the majority of the Cuban people, everything what we have, it is thanks to the changes that the revolution did at the very beginning in 1959. So it is the majority of the Cuban people, no, of the Cuban people, no matter if we work with the government, with the state, or a, a, in, in, in a private enterprise, 
the majority of us has a very high level of identification with the social process of Cuba because it is the result of people's participation. So one uh, mental uh, barrier that we have to overcome in Cuba, and it is another example in my opinion, is that self-employed workers are as Cubans as ourselves and we are also all defending the Cuban revolution and the Cuban achievements. Another thing has to do with the migratory policy. In the past, we have different regulations. Yes, that's true. But it is, in my view, one of the main decisions that we have made during this process. Just to open many of those regulations, Cubans traveling abroad everywhere they want, and it has had, so far, a very positive impact. Alarcón mentioned one of them, the very good relation between Cuba and the Cuban nation. When you hear that idea, the Cuban nation for us, it is Cubans living wherever they live. Because we do not want a separation between Cubans of Cuba, Cubans in Miami, Cuba. When we go to other countries and you say, oh, I'm Cuban, many people say, from Miami or from Cuba? No, 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 we are all Cubans. And it is a very important point in our view. So I don't want to put examples only of a concrete economical thing. I think that one of the changes is that we have decided to change our mentality. And to change our mentality is not only approving new laws or adjusting the laws to the current situation of the Cuban economy, it is also to open our minds and to feel that socialism is the society that, yes, we want socialism, but it's a Cuban socialism with inclusivity, with respect, with, without discrimination, and with the right of every one of us to participate in the decision making. I, I think it is one of the things that we recognize. recognize. And self-criticism is a revolutionary value. And I believe that it is one of the values of the current process that we are doing. So it means that we are independent, we are capable, and we are empowered to continue despite other difficulties, but we are also very committed with the Latin American and Caribbean integration. Because if Cuba is here, if we want this huge victory, it is also thanks of, to Venezuela and to other uh, ALBA, UNASUR, CELAC processes in Latin America that we will support with all our energies. That's my opinion on that. Thank you, Kenya. We have a specific question about Asata Shakur, and maybe whoever answers it could just state her case for those who don't know. Is there any possibility that Asata Shakur's status in Cuba could change as a result of the normalization of relations? No, the answer is very simple. No. No, of course. Of course. Um, a Asata Shakur. Asata is a, an intellectual, an African American living in Cuba for a number of years. She was a victim of the repression against the Black Panther movement back in the 60s, 70s. Um, she was uh, uh, the victim of a trial in which she was found guilty. It was not the, the first case in your history where a, a black person is a, a victimized by, by courts and, and so on. I, I don't want to elaborate much more on that. One day, she managed to escape from the federal prison where she was. And she finally came down to Cuba and asked for asylum, and she was granted it. She's not a terrorist. She's not doing anything against any government. She has been living in Cuba for, my God, she's in the 70s or early 80s. Um, and she's now, she is now really a victim and a target of the worst forces in the American society. 
they managed to have the FBI offering two million, it's now I think, three, they raised it to three. They are inviting Americans now that we are getting, I hope, much more Americans coming down, where they try to get you as, as uh, collaborators in taking this woman and in sending her back to prison in the US. It's a real threat on her life that is openly being promoted by some US politicians and the FBI. And uh, you can be sure that Asata will never be abandoned by us. That she, and that she, she deserves to get the attention of the American people to put an end to this um, policy of persecution or threatening of that uh, woman. One I stayed very active on this uh, uh, campaign against Assad is the state of New Jersey because it was for New Jersey where the incident that was framed took place. You have a lot of people in New Jersey that deserve to be back there in jail. Beginning with the, your, your, the illustrious senator, Bob Menendez. It's a state that has plenty, plenty of criminals. Even at the highest offices in the Senate. He's trying to persecute a poor woman that is doing harm to nobody and has the right to live in peace and security in the someday in her own country. But as long as she cannot do that, we will abide by our decision to grant her political asylum in this country that is also her country now. Thank you. Well, there are a number of questions about Cuba's relations with different uh, countries or what's Cuba's position on the status of Puerto Rico. There's a question about Cuba's relationship to the Nine Align movement, uh, also about Cuba's relationship with Palestine, and separately a question about Cuba's relationship with Israel, and final was about relationship with Russia. So. I don't know that you can take all of these, but uh, a couple of them. Oceania. Oceania, yes. Can you comment and then No? Well, in Puerto Rico, of course, we are against the colonial status of Puerto Rico, and we are, of course, committed to uh, continue campaigning for the freedom of, 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 Cap, of Oscar Lopez Rivera, uh, an independence that for more than 30 four years now, has been in prison. We consider him, and he is, the uh, prisoner, the political prisoner in the Western Hemisphere that for a longer time has been illegally or unjustly in prison. And additionally, we uh, stand by Puerto Rico and we hope to see in the near future Puerto Rico to become a member, a full member of the Latin American and Caribbean community an independent state, and we hope that the Puerto Rican people continues having the right to decide on their independent status. And we have many friends in Puerto Rico, and they come to Cuba very, very often. In the case of Israel, we don't have relations with them. Uh, we broke relations with Israel because of the massacre against the Palestinian people. And of course, we hope that uh, when they uh, fulfill the uh, resolutions by the UN that establish the existence of an independent state in Palestine with Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem as a capital. Thanks to the return of the refugees and with the freedom of the political prisoners, that day will be the day, and of course when the genocide against the Palestinian people ends, 
that will be the day that we rejoin relations with Israel. If not, it is not going to, to happen. Another thing, another question is? Yeah, the non-aligned movement, of course we are members, of course we support the non-aligned movement. Cuba was the president of uh, the movement back in uh, the year, at the beginning of the 2000. Yes, and, pero ya más cercano volvimos a tener la cumbre en el 2006, fue a la cumbre. Uh, by 2006, I'm sorry, I'm not very accurate on the on that date. But uh, at the beginning of the this century, we again, we, we, as a, a country, we were the presidents of the non-aligned movement. And in our view, the Cuban presidency uh, recovered the original principles and functioning of the non-aligned movement. And we include many countries that by the time at the beginning were not independent but now they are independent and Cuba reinforced the importance of the non-aligned movement. I feel that very soon they will have new summits and meetings and we hope the non-aligned movement continues to be a very important principle and a movement for the South in this uh, very unfair world where multilateralism is in crisis. So we need to, to support the non-aligned movement and many other movements against the unipolar world where the United States government wants to oblige us to accept. And it is our, our position in foreign affairs. Russia, we have very good relations with Russia, very good relations. And of course, remember that in the past, when the Soviet Union existed, we had excellent relations with the uh, bloc, with the Soviet bloc and all the countries that made part of the bloc. One day in the 90s, it disappeared and it affected us a lot. Uh, we lost 85% of the Cuban domestic uh, product. But believe me, as a Cuban that we were born in the middle of these difficult times, we won't cry over the spell milk. We consider that it happened, and Alarcón spoke about that. Clearly, there are many lessons that we have to learn from that, but nowadays, we have very good relations with the Kerel government in Russia. They are very supportive of Cuba, of our Cuban independence, and we collaborate a lot in, in terms of the bilateral relations and in, in the multilateral scenery. We also cooperate with them a lot. What else? Well, this is a very profound question, uh, really. It says, um, since the Arab Spring, many ordinary Arab people who were once thought there would be such promise have now been squeezed between opposing armies and militias. What lessons can Cuba give to help raise their hopes? I like what they can see some positive change. I think that the, what is going on in that part of the world. Possibly knowing that it's the U.S. Congress that will not allow the prison to close, and so cutting Obama some slack, not pushing so hard on Guantanamo, or because it's not among the priorities for the economy. But some of the, the question was, as Americans, we feel so terribly that prisoners, that the US has chosen Guantanamo as a place to so abuse the prisoners there, that for us, it's perhaps even a bigger issue. And we, the question is, um, what can we do to raise the profile of this issue of Guantanamo, and uh, what can we do at home to push harder that Guantanamo gets back into the hands of Cubans? Thank you. Yes, we are pushing in order to have the Guantanamo illegally occupied territory return to our sovereignty. And of course, we have always respected the international law, and we want that territory to be returned to Cuba without using other means but the legality, the international uh, legality. And of course, I believe that Obama, since the very beginning of his uh, presidency, he said that he will close the prison and we added, and you have to return Guantanamo to the Cuban sovereignty. 
So I believe that the U.S. Congress is the one that will make the decision, but that decision will be made if we push. And your contribution, I know that Code Pink has been very active on that, but I do consider that it is important to push more and more intensively right now. And uh, this November, we will have an international seminar against military bases in Guantanamo, together with the Cuban uh, movement for peace and sovereignty. So we could give you more information on that because it is not only Guantanamo, there are many other military bases of a new kind or the old style in military bases all over the world. So believe me, yes, and Raul, our president, has mentioned that in several uh, international events and summits where he has been representing us. For instance, right now, a few days ago, in Panama, in front of President Obama, Raul said clearly that there is not a, a possible normal relations between Cuba and the USA without returning Guantanamo to the Cuban government. So yes, we are active on that. We need you a lot. Huh? So uh, Code Pink made a commitment to take 50 people to Guantanamo for the uh, seminar in November, and it's a seminar around uh, the stopping foreign military bases everywhere, and we're very excited about going in that, and there is one uh, of the meetings in our uh, week long that is to visit with the uh, Cuban movement for peace and sovereignty uh, that is hosting that seminar. So I think we have two, time for two more questions. Um, one is, a, a, a couple of them are about the uh, economic tsunami. Uh, we have already seen on our plane over here a delegation from Georgia, businessmen, you've had the Texans, you had uh, Governor Cuomo from New York, you've had delegation after delegation, and they want to make money. And what will this do to the issue of equality and socialism? What will it do to the healthy organic food that most Cubans have been eating? We know the president of Cargill has been here and is very anxious to do more and more trade with Cuba. They're actually working very well to try to lift the embargo. Um, so any, any of these uh, issues that you can address? <laughs> Well, I was I was looking to the back of this uh, back of the editors. I don't know if you know who is this guy. Carlos Manuel de Céspedes is like uh, the father of our nation, el padre de la patria in our world. I should have referred to him answering some of the previous questions because. Uh, uh, it's a way to really to appreciate the consistency of history. That man was uh, the initiator of our War of Independence in 1868. He was elected by our National Assembly, because we also have had assemblies and constitutions since those days, as the first president. And the vice president, he was, of course, the president presiding in the mountains, in the, in the, at, the, at the war. His vice president, Francisco Vicente Aguilera, is not there. Where was he? In New York. Take that to remember what I told you about the importance of the Cuban immigration long, long before the 1959 revolution. That since the beginning of our struggle for the independence, it was so important that the vice president of the revolutionary government was there, not here. That's one thing. So if you're wondering what's happening behind your head, we're just holding up a banner to do a picture. But if you could look this way, Ricardo and Kenya, um, <laughs> then we can get your picture. Thanks from Code Pink. Your art, we bring our artist along with us who is behind you and he did your name tag. So you're, you have the one from last time. Now you can switch to this time. And um, 
our theme of Code Pink is Make Out Not War, so we figured that was appropriate here as well. But this has been an incredible uh, morning for us. Really profound answers to a lot of different questions. And knowing that this is a time when so much is going on in these days, for you have taken the time out to be with us and to answer so uh, profoundly and openly and honestly, let's give a tremendous hand to you. Thank you. All these questions is what you will see in Cuba. Anti, anti-capitalista. Anti